Is our mic working? Yes, it is. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen only mode. Good morning. Did you guys win last night? I don't know. I really haven't even been keeping up with that stuff. Okay. Most Wait, likely, what? no. <laughs> uh, I'm going to ask if they can hear the music in the back. Yeah. I guess when the music stops, you know what that means. It means the class is about to start. And uh, it takes me about five minutes to hook up everything at the webinar to make sure everything is working right. I had another webinar earlier this morning, and I don't know if that screwed up our attendance for now, but it doesn't matter because the other webinar was uh, absolutely essential. I also uh, take a couple of minutes to write down whatever thoughts I think are pertinent uh, related to the class for today or even related to things in general, which I forgot to tell you before. And I guess I can figure out how far I can wander from the microscope by looking at that green thing. So this looks like it's okay. Well, hit the orange button there and it'll pop back in. At least it won't hide the rest of the screen for us. And you can close the music box too. Um, when I gave this, uh, course for the last three years, I generally counted the number of hours that I had to go over both path one and path two. And it turned out to be about 150 hours. 
Now, I don't know how many total hours are allocated to your path one or path two course. I suspect that if you add them up, it's quite a bit more. So that's why in the process now of giving the same course here, I have to add a lot of things uh, to the PowerPoints, uh, and they're significantly upgraded. And I try to keep those recent upgrades on the M drive as well. So I forgot to do it this morning, but uh, don't be surprised if the M drive constantly gets bigger if the PowerPoint didn't get better. I was really, really spoiled badly for the last several years because I gave the course for two hours, uh, two days a week during almost the entire year. And uh, it was really, really uh, a very being spoiled experience because I would basically wake up whenever I wanted it. I wouldn't have to shave, I wouldn't have to get dressed. I would eventually get my cup of coffee and then once the caffeine started kicking in, I played the music that helped as well. And then we got going for two hours, we had a nice break, and uh, it was all in the quiet and peace and sanctity of my own home. Now this is a little bit different, you know, like getting dressed and stuff like that and having to readjust my caffeine time. Um, the announcement that I want to make purely for the online students today is to thank them for hanging in there with me because they have been used to for years, every Tuesday, Thursday, nine o'clock Chicago time for two hours, and now we've had to do a lot of adjustments and mixing it up. But they all know that they can get these movies online at GoPath, a streaming video, or they can always go back to the previous year, which are also online and on my website as well. Uh, we could probably start to uh, ease into the uh, topic today. Uh, and I, I just want to throw something at you. I don't want it to be a big, big, big uh, point of discussion or agonizing, but you know, there's, in all the years I've been teaching, you know, there's something I haven't uh, quite figured out yet. And maybe you haven't either. Uh, I'm always torn tremendously between sharing with you and giving to you what I think is absolutely necessary for you to know enough about diseases to be good doctors. Well, that sounds pretty noble, doesn't it? But on the other hand, there is another conflicting, diametrically opposed force. And it's called the step one. And even though I have not figured this out yet, and even though you may not agree with me, I am fully convinced that learning to do well on an exam is diametrically opposed to learning enough about diseases to fulfill your dream to be the kind of doctor you've always wanted to be. I don't know how to solve that problem. What I've been doing is making sure I cover all the main points in Robbins, because that's a good book. And, uh, you know, I am really uh, opposed and resentful, and it makes me kind of sick to think that my job is to stand up here and uh, try to second guess what some poor bastard is going to put on an exam who's never even practiced medicine before and probably isn't even a pathologist. Like, I, I have a real rebellion against that. But nevertheless, I know in the real world you all want to do well. So I constantly vacillate between the two. If any of you have any ideas or comments, I would really, really appreciate them. Uh, either by email or, you know, jump up now and tell me what I have to do different. Uh, that's the only other announcement that I wanted to make. Now we'll get into the actual uh, topic for today, which will be the continuation of infectious diseases. I was uh, uh, really pretty pleased on the last class because I had not really known what your background was in micro, and I could tell with the material we presented, which was not my favorite sort of topic, it's going over the taxonomy and quickly going over diseases. I thought, well, if they haven't had micro, their heads are going to be spinning, they're going to be really mad at me. And if they have a good micro, of course, uh, at the very least, they'll think it's, you know, a, a good refresher from a disease or pathology point of view. Or maybe they're saying, well, we already know that crap. Why do you have to show it again? So the difference between last class and this class 
is that this class is more what I agree with really enjoy more. It's like real pathology. Now, there'll be a little bit of cat's eye in there and a little bit of review, no doubt. But it's really going to be, uh, now that we're almost done with this whole taxonomic discussion, is getting into some of the real disease processes associated <coughs> with these bugs, uh, both generically as well as according to individual groupings. So if you go down to the taskbar, you probably see a PowerPoint that's uh, halfway open there. That's a good place to start. Okay. And, oh, let's see, it's the one, just click on the one that says PowerPoints, right here. I think it's this one, isn't it? Or the one that says chapter eight? Either way. That's what I was saying. Yeah, that'll do it. Is that where we left off? Okay. The reason why I decided to stop at this point last time is because I uh, was very tempted to go off on a rant. Because when I did my two or three session introduction to pathology, I talk about the three biggest parasites in the world to physicians. And I have very massive rants on each one. And of course, it's no big surprise, malpractice is going to be covered pretty much at the top of the list. I have a very, very special hatred, however, for the second type of parasite, and they're called corporate administrators. Because what they do, you probably don't care about this right now. But what they do is they take your hard work. They take your wonderful relationship with the third party payers. And they try to gobble it up. In the old days, we go to a hospital and tell the administrator, hey, jerk, you are just the guy that owns the box that we practice medicine in. So shut your mouth or we'll practice it somewhere else. It's not quite that way now because the corporations have multi-billion dollar legal coffers. And it's basically been a losing battle uh, uh, for the physicians because they have learned how to divide and conquer us. The same way we divide and conquer you by saying some of you will be allowed to go on and some of you are going to flunk out. That's how it all starts. And then when you finally get into practice, you have completely forgot what it feels like to stand together in solidarity. The third type of parasite are regulators of your license. They could be at the state level, they could be at the federal level, and it's very, very easy for them to parasitize you because when you sign your little contract with Medicare and Medicaid, you are agreeing to obey more rules and regulations than there are arteries, veins, and nerves in the entire human body. So it's not surprising that they could take anybody. You know, you could go to jail for overbuilding. You could go to jail for underbuilding. Somebody threatened me with 480 years in jail. The and I said, excuse me, I'd rather just have the rejection. So they say, well, if you, if you plead guilty to one count of a tiring or sense of report, you know, uh, we'll, we'll just give you probation. So uh, physicians are really, really, really besieged by the parasites. But the kind of parasites we're talking about now are much simpler. I guess you could say parasites would generally be in the class of metazoan and protozoan. Protozoans are one cell parasites, metazoans, multiple cell parasites. I guess that things like arthropods are also metazoans because they have more than one cell in their body. But generally, when we say metazoan, we're talking about worms. We're talking about either round worms or tapeworms. And we're going to go through the life cycle of the most common type of round worm and tapeworm. Yet. Even if you went through it in micro, I think it's very important. I don't think we can go into all of them, but I have a few general tips, especially from the point of view of diagnostic pathology, how to differentiate them. Then we'll say a few words about the so-called arthropods. And if you remember, two big orders in arthropods, or is it a class or a family? I forget. One are the arthropods with six legs, those are the insects, and the other ones are the arthropods with eight legs, which are the arachnids, the spiders, snakes, and mice. Okay. Uh, let's do the next one. Protozoans, quickly, I'm sure now that you have gone through some of this, but if you want to just kind of quickly group the protozoans that are important in pathology, uh, especially worldwide pathology, perhaps not so much in that nice place you want to be practicing called the United States, uh, without a doubt, plasmodium, four different species, 
at the top of the list. Malaria, I don't know, is it the biggest parasite? Is it the biggest killer in the world? Some people say it is. It's of overwhelming importance. And we're going to be looking into the different kinds of diagnostically from the point of view of the lab. And we're going to extensively to the life cycle. Leishmania, also a protozoa, producing a disease that's usually chiefly cutaneous and subcutaneous, sometimes deeper, knowing that it's the sand fly that's the vector, just like the mosquito is the vector of uh, malaria. Trypanosomes, sleeping sickness, the CC fly in Africa, big, big, big disease, affecting and killing millions of people. South America, a trypanosomal a disease called Chagas disease, mostly Central America, not so much South America. And we're not far from it. There might even be some cases here. I don't know. Toxoplasma, cats, something that really normal people don't get. If you're an immunocompromised patient, like an AIDS patient, you're at very high risk for it. And if you're an AIDS patient that comes in with a local central nervous system lesion, there's about a 50% chance of toxoplasmosis. Before AIDS came around, nobody ever had toxoplasmosis of the brain. Uh, Entamoeba, you know, the common amoeba, amoebic dysentery, Entamoeba cola, Entamoeba <coughs> other species. Chiefly limited to the mucosa again, if you remember our list, but also can cause abscesses in the liver, in soft tissues, amoebic abscesses. Um, is there anything else you want to say? You could zip this up a little bit more. I don't know. I, a lot of this stuff I sometimes just snap off of uh, Wikipedia because what I have noticed is that even though Robbins is the really, really good textbook, so there are certain things you just want to know fast. And if I have found in my experience that if you take the first three or four lines of Wikipedia on a disease, somebody has very, very, very carefully made sure that they're giving you exactly the right information to have you know what you want to know in four lines. And if they, and if they don't give it to you, somebody's going to edit it. And they're going to say, no, that's wrong. This is the way to say it better. That's the beautiful thing about Wikipedia. Has anybody here ever made a Wikipedia entry? You know, it's, it's really a very interesting thing. Uh, even though you can say whatever you want, that's wrong. Somebody's going to edit you on it. OK, let's do the next one. Uh, I think it's worth, again, to look at the general uh, protozoans and look at them in terms of where they do their damage. And if you want to think very logically and very anatomically, you can think of uh, places that are outside of epithelium, you know, like movements of organ and outside of skins. If you want to think of the protozoans, as uh, doing a little bit more damage deeper than they're going to chiefly involve that epithelium. You want to think more logically, you could say, well, the next step is really to invade that epithelium wind up somewhere in the blood. And of course, there's this handful of uh, protozoans, which I think we're talking about here, which is uh, going to be intracellular, you know, like malaria, like other ones. So let's make this as big as we can. You don't have to do a maximum screen, you can just drop down that entire thing. And you can probably see it better now. I guarantee you, even though the people in the back row have eyes that are better than mine, uh, most likely they couldn't see it. But if the, the people that are watching this at webinar now, you know, in Zanzibar, you know, they can see it because they're on their computer. So uh, once again, let's look at uh, this progression of invasion. You could probably also think of that as invasion like a tumor as well, which you spent a lot of time on. Parasites primarily luminal, perhaps not even involving the epithelium very much, like a tapeworm. It has a scolex, the scolex has a hook. That thing basically just hooks onto the intestinal mucosa, the epithelium. And it doesn't really do much of direct tissue damage. The multi just eats your food. Uh, Good example, Entamoeba histopedica, you know, the number one cause of amoebic dysentery, primarily a dysenterial disease. Do they have abscesses as well? Yes, they can. Do they usually? No. 
gallon sodium chloride, a very common cause of colitis. Trophozoic, which is also primarily luminal, maybe a little bit of interaction with the epithelium. Uh, ATF amoeba, you know, another uh, thing that can cause a meningoencephalitis. Okay, so that's not really limited to a lumen because you actually can convey the central nervous system. Now, why this is uh, in the luminal thing, I don't know, because primarily it just stays in the GI tract. GRD alarm, really good example. Maybe you've had it, maybe you know that's the reason why in many places they tell you don't drink the water, like Mexico. And so you say, well, you know, if I go down to Tijuana, I could probably get a snow cone in at least. Well, you know, those little tropes you live inside the pipes too. But it's primarily uh, an organism which causes uh, diseases limited to lumens, small bowel, like maybe large bowel a little bit. Cryptosporidium, okay, usually not of concern at all to us. There could, I bet you, if you wanted to do a little project, you'd probably find Cryptosporidium all over the place, not just on this island, but in the United States. No problem, we probably all have a few of them in our GI tract. No, maybe there's some in my coffee, because I use tap water. Uh, but if you're immunosuppressed, those little bugs are gonna start chewing up your uh, GI mucosa are causing a lot of diarrheal type diseases. It's once again, limited primarily luminal epithelial. Trichomonas, you know, trick, primarily luminal epithelial. It doesn't invade, it doesn't go into the blood, it doesn't go into cells. Let's go a little bit deeper into the bloodstream. Plasmodium, okay, babesiosis. I'm just out of curiosity, is this the first time you're hearing the word babesiosis or was it referred to? So you basically know more or less what it is. Okay, good. I'm very happy about that. Trypanosomes, sleeping sickness. Okay, these are things that are going into the blood. They can very easily be seen in the blood as well. Sometimes even without special states. You know, if you are in a, working in a hematology, a hospital lab, somebody comes in, you know, with malaria. Yeah, there are some modifications of your basic right stain, W-R-I-G-H-T, that you could do that could make them seem easier, but you can see them a little bit even without any special states. What about the deeply invasive ones, the ones that go inside of cells? They're no longer limited to lumen or surface epithelium, going into the bloodstream, intracellular, once again, Chagas disease, through canosoma crudia, as opposed to the trypanosome species that cause African sleeping sickness. The Cruzii guys are causing Chagas disease in Central and South America. There might be some here. I, I really don't know. Leishmaniasis is primarily cutaneous, mucocutaneous, but it's inside the cells. Toxoplasma has coccidia, trophozoites, which are also intracellular. Okay, so I almost said if you wanted to memorize that, you can. I know I would never do that. But I think what's more important to do is just to get the feel for the anatomical uh, limitations or hangouts of some of these parasites, so the superficial degree. That's a lot too hard. It's very possible that somewhere in micro, not that you learn exactly all of the life cycles of, that, of these things, you probably would test it on it as well. I guarantee you, oh, I don't know why that's a yellow slide, but you know, I, I don't think I'd ever test anybody on that. It's too sadistic. Next one. Helmets, very simple. <coughs> Round worms, tape worms. If you want to call these flat worms, you can. If you want to call them cup worms, you can, because there's well, you can't really call it a hookworm because that's a different kind of worm, but sometimes they are referred to as hookworms sim for the simple fact that their scolexes or their anterior or superior most segment uh, has little hooks. And they're in the family of cestodes, whereas all of the roundworms are in the family of nematodes. So there's Ascaris, Toxicara, causing the disease also causing something called visceral migra, migraines, 
Stradivoides, small roundworm, Enterobius. Okay, common, common roundworms. The genesis of tapeworms that are important in the entire world, but mostly not in the United States, are in four categories. They're the tania, and don't confuse that with the tinea, which is the generic word for fungus infection of the skin. It's a very common error that's done by a lot of people. These are tanias, T-A-E-N-I-A, and if it's from, ultimately from beef, it's called saginata, and it's ultimately from pork, that's called sodium. And there's the diphylogrothrium latum, which is the fish tapeworm, and then there's hymenolepsis, and the reason why I put that in small letters. The species is called Manna. You can think of it as small. It's a very, very small tapeworm. And in addition, not only very, very small, but when you look at the different types of skull, uh, uh, proglottids or segments that these tapeworms have, this one has the lowest <coughs> ratio of height to width because it's the smallest one. The biggest animal, the cow, has the highest ratio. It looks like a colonus. Next one. Okay, uh, common roundworm. They look round. The only place that you'll ever hear of it, most likely, will be in your patients, maybe even younger patients, or center appendectomies. You know, appendicitis is often a disease of either. It's usually a disease of young people or old people, middle-aged people like us don't think you get it too much. Very likely, uh, the pathologist will say there's a little bit of a worm inside that appendix. Pin worm, so to speak. Enteropius formicularis, because it's in the vermiform appendix. Is one way to remember it. And they're very round, they can be very easily identified. And most likely, it may not even cause any symptoms. If somebody has an appendicitis, and there also happens to be an enteropius vermicularis inside of that vermiform appendix, most likely that bug is not causing the appendicitis. Next one. This is a good time to look in a little bit more depth at the not only a typical life cycle of a roundworm, but the most uh, clinically and medically important roundworm on planet Earth, and that's Ascaris. Now, originally, I used to show this one and go over it quickly, and it has these little triangles and yellows. This is, this is a government document. This is uh, from the CDC. This is what CDC throws out to everybody. And I thought, you know, like any other government document, it's really confusing. So uh, just recently, I found something a lot better. And if you want to really understand the life cycle of Ascaris, it's probably better to look at something like this. And a good place to start is an infected head. Fecal oral route, contaminated. They're swallowed. They hatch in the small intestine, okay? The larvae can then go through the hepatic portal circulation through the intestinal wall and get into the lungs. So you go through the mouth, through the intestine, through the portal circulation. I guess if you want to draw, draw a straight arrow, we're now in the lungs and it causes an upper respiratory. And that's usually just a few days after the swallowing of the infected eggs. The uh, can evoke a coughing uh, reflex as well. And uh, after the and it could then be swallowed again because of the coughing. And then it goes on to develop the sexual differentiation of males and females in the uh, small intestine, primarily, which will then uh, uh, shed eggs outside into the soul. That, that to me, that seems like a pretty logical route. And uh, I don't think I want to say anything about this. It basically shows the same thing, but not quite as educational as that one. Next one, please. What about probably the most likely life cycle for a uh, tapeworm? 
but one called it flat work, one called it sedimentary work, or if you want to call it assessed or it's all basically the same thing. Well, I kept the CDC documents, but a good place to start is here. You know that with the pork, tapeworm, tinea, sodium, as opposed to the beef, tapeworm, tinea, saginata, you're basically going to have little argospheres inside of the pig muscle. If the pork is not cooked very well, it's eaten by the human. Okay, once it's eaten by the human, it goes through the digestive system and it doesn't have too many circular routes into the lungs and stuff like that, but eventually they can become little sister sarcosis, walled off abscesses, so to speak, the human tissues, just like it was in the pig, but not limited to skeletal muscle. We're going to have a case of the lab in which we see a wall of a sister sarcosis that can be there very often can occur in the brain, subcutaneous tissues, eyes, and they just love the central nervous system. But they can literally occur anywhere. Uh, if they go on to mature in the intestine, these are the things that become very big. So when we talked about that one 10 meter, single parasite, you know, which is theoretically possible, you're basically having the segmentation of uh, proglot, it's uh, the most uh, anterior, or superior, I'm sorry, it's the most superior one, specialized into the hook that holds on to everything else. And then these things are going to be uh, shedding eggs uh, again, which can be picked up by the kids. That's what's called cycling sexual cycle, when you're involved in both uh, male and female uh, gametes, very often an asexual cycle as an other part of the cycle. Next one, please. So I did not mention the other two common parasites. I don't know if you went into their uh, life cycles of the fish, tapeworm, and hymenolepsis nana, but I know that it's generally good to understand how some of these things look because very often the uh, diagnostic identification of this is to look at the stool. And you know, people would bring uh, specimens into our lab, you know, that their kids have shed, and we would have to determine uh, if indeed it was some kind of worm or whether it was something else. Uh, one thing that I realize is that the bigger the animal, the more columnar the, pro, uh, the proglottic. So what's the biggest animal? Saginata. The cow, look how tall that is, like a columnar. So what's the smallest one? Well, the one that has nano in its name is the smallest. And look at that. So if you wanted to say that's like a columnar cell and that's like a squamous cell, and the one in the middle, you know, the fish tapeworm is more like a tuboidal cell, and, you know, whoops, I'm sorry, this is, this is the tallest one, isn't it? So, that's the, it's tall because it's the biggest animal. Here's something that's still pretty tall, but not as big as that. Here's something that's rather cuboidal. And that's something that you might want to just keep in mind, if you ever, you know, have to use your duct. Of course, what really happens is that when this does happen, no matter what you think, it's brought into the lab, and they go into the books, and then they wind up trying to figure out what it is. And even when somebody absolutely has it nailed, they realize it's going to be the thing that just happens to be endemic to the area anywhere. So let's go to the next one. The biggest uh, metazoans of all in terms of complexity, the arthropods, you know, the six-legged arthropods called insect class insecta, the eighth legged arthropods, class arachnida, lice, bed bugs, and fleas, six legs, mites, ticks, and spiders, eight legs. Um, you probably went into these in some detail, I think from a pathologic identification point of view. Uh, if you want to group them together, we'll say a few words about the next one. 
even though there are mice that affect pubic hair as well as body and head hair, they're completely different a genus. You know, the ones that affect the head and the body hair or capitus and corpus respectively, pediculosis capitus for head, pediculosis corpus for body, looking very, very similar with the nits you know, at the base of the hair, near the hair follicle. It's a completely different species from the one that affects the pubic area. This is a phthiris. It's the only word I know that begins with P-H-T-H, -H, and that's a completely different uh, genus. It's a completely different bug, and it's the only one that's called crabs. You would never say somebody has crabs of uh, head hair or body hair. You say they have crabs of pubic hair. So it's because it looks like a crab. That's almost a slam dunk, easy identification. They look totally different from these. Even though insects are generally called bugs by everybody, we all know that insects and bugs are completely different things. Bugs happens to be probably the single biggest subset of insects, but it's the only thing that affects humans that actually looks like a bug, are the bed bugs. And you know what they look like, they look like a whole wide variety of inflammatory skin regions. They kind of make you itch right now just looking at it, doesn't it? And uh, the fleas, extremely easy to identify, even grossly. You see them on your dogs, you see them on your cats. Sometimes you see them jump on yourself as well. So, quick identification. I thought these were great pictures. They're not from Robbins. I Googled them to be most typical of what you might see here looking at them carefully with good eyes. Next one, arachnids. Okay, the arachnids with eight legs. So now I know what you're thinking. You're saying, well, he said arachnids have eight legs, but this tick over here has only six. Well, yeah, there's a, there's a smaller ones. If you look closely, there's really eight. That's a typical tick. You know, they in the United States, uh, Lyme disease is the number one arthropod-borne disease. I can tell you that because I hate it, and I don't want to go into that again. It's not just in Connecticut, it's all over the place now. We have a crack for every part of the United States. Uh, a mite, also an eight-legged um, arthropod in the uh, insect, I'm sorry, in the arachnid family, classical appearance externally. And primary mite, if you have a patient that's infected by the mite, most likely 95% chance or more, it's going to be scabies. Scabies are adult mites occupying and infecting and chewing up and living in the epidermis, hair follicles. There are some mites that the larva actually lives inside of the hair follicle, and that's called demodex. T E M O D E X. And well, their last name is Folliculorum because they live in hair follicles. And if you look at these, it's, it's a pretty grisly sight. I think from this uh, scanning electron micrograph, you can recognize that as a hair. But there's a couple of things in that same follicle that are a little bit thicker than the hair. And they're white. And those are the actual mites developing in hair follicles. It's very, very common. You know, these diseases are. With scabies, it's very, very common. Uh, people have a poor hygiene, you know, drug addicts, people that are just not taking care of themselves too well. This should go without saying, you know what the red violin means? No arachnid that can often, but not always, have a fatal like the black widow spider. Um, most likely situation for a black widow spider bite, anybody want to guess? is uh, in, in a, uh, what do they call those rural outhouses, you know? I think it's called outhouses, because that's where they love to live, <coughs> they love their little webs there. And uh, very often it's the genital area that's dead. The brown recluse, I don't have a picture of it, and it's not fatal, but it has a toxin in it that can do incredible soft tissue damage. You know, sometimes, in very extreme cases, 
uh, requiring an amputation. This is halfway amputated already, but often very, very, very destructive. You know, I, I've seen rattlesnake bites that help look at that. So, quick identification for the common ones. Uh, next one. Scabies, a really, really, really nice view. You're never likely to see this in any of your patients that come in with a wide variety of inflammatory uh, dermatoses. If you, do, if you Google uh, scabies uh, dermatitis right now, and you can't, you probably can see every part of the body involved. It can literally live anywhere. However, the most likely place to harvest them for identification, scrape them, is in the dorsal aspect of the uh, MP area. Because uh, if the patient is symptomatic there, they can be symptomatic anywhere. But very often, they're involved in dispersing up with them. And, uh, that's very, if you're getting a scraping of one of the patients symptomatic, but there's a good chance you'll receive those things from a scrape. Okay. Well, we're, we're sort of finished with our long little journey through the general uh, taxonomy. And I get a very good feeling that uh, this is not the first time you've seen it. You maybe even have gone to a very detail. And that's why this is not intended to be, you know, a micro course. This is infectious disease related to human pathology. So most of the, the rest of the discussion today will not be in any microbiologic taxonomic classifications and brief mentioning of things. We're going to be talking about basic disease patterns based on this. And uh, this is from Robbins, and I'd like to keep it very simple. Isn't it no big surprise to see that the main barriers the pathogenic infections are the same as the barriers we have to any type of you know, harsh exposure to our body. It's epithelium, it's skin, it's GI mucosa, it's respiratory mucosa, it's also urinary tract mucosa. Very different kinds of mucosa, you know, transitional here, perhaps uh, squamous in the upper area or uh, ciliated columnar, pseudostratified ciliated columnar, mostly columnar here, stratified scrubs, these are our barriers. And it is also no big surprise that when you examine these barriers in normal people, it's very likely that underneath this barrier, you'll see a lot of lymphoid tissue. It's generally called malt. Uh, it's loosely referred to as Peyer's patches when it comes to GI. But it's no big surprise that not only are these areas the barrier, uh, the first line of defense, but they're ready for a little attack by virtue of having lymphoid tissue underneath them as well. And most people don't know that the actual amount of malt or mucosal associated lymphoid tissue that's in the GI tract is greater than the actual amount of lymphoid tissue in the lymph nodes that drain the GI tract. So it's no big surprise. These are the barriers. Uh, and they're no different from pathogenic organisms than they are from any other substance in the environment that can potentially hurt us. Next one. And it should also be no big surprise that if there is an infection and those barriers break down due to a, a wide variety of reasons, that the actual spread of the infection, which you remember as, you know, the so-called inflammatory process, acute inflammation, organizing inflammation, chronic. the actual spread of that process is going to be remarkably similar to what we probably spent a, a lot of time learning about for the spread of the tumor as well. Because it's going to be localized at first. It may be an abscess. It may be an encapsulated abscess. It may be not encapsulated. It just may be a localized area of acute inflammation. You can see extension or infiltration, if you prefer the word, or dissection is another good word, into the surrounding areas. Most likely picked up by the lymphatics, causing reaction, a variety of reactive processes in lymph nodes, including the organisms actually being in the lymph nodes as well. You may not see them, but if you do PCI on those lymph nodes, they're there. 
and that's a general good principle. They can also involve the blood, just like tumors can as well. They can also travel along nerves, can't they? Just like you know, tumor cells can spread along the nerves as well. So these are the uh, possibilities for uh, spreading of infections. And there, you don't have to remember anything new about that because it's the same uh, route or spread uh, avenues as we see for tumors as well. Next one. What about release? No. What about when these organisms do their job and now they multiply and now they are shed? Well, no big surprise here. You can get them from the skin. Now, it's every room I walk, every men's room I walk into, this whole university has these big sites. Wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. In, in the U.S., by law, they have to have those sites in the middle. It's like one of the primary ways. Respiratory droplets, coughing, sneezing, uh, airborne, in the urine, in the feces, you know, sanitation, you know, with, with the big, massive, Infections that have gone on, that are still going on to a certain degree in Haiti, in these epidemics. It's primarily, and in any third world country, it's primarily due to sanitation methods. It's the introduction of urine and feces into the drinking water. Bloodborne. And something that is uh, also mentioned as a zoonotic, because zo is the root word for animal, and they're spread by other animals, a lot of times arthropods, but there could be other mammals. It's not completely different from the rest of these, but it's another way. And the same thing with sexually transmitted diseases, too. Could a sexually transmitted disease transmission be skin? Yeah. Could it be urine? Yeah. Could it be fecal? Yeah. Could it be blood? Yeah. You know, so but for some reason, this uh, last category of transmission uh, overlaps very, very largely with the other ones, and it's nothing really new. Next one. Okay. This was not from Robbins. Uh, it may have been from the second edition of Robbins, and it's probably something that you learned over and over and over again in my world, but it's worth repeating. It looks a little bit like Ohm's Law, doesn't it? But this is really when you use, when somebody gets infected with anything, you think of three things. What's the degree or amount or magnitude or severity or intensity or infectivity of that organism? What's that? What's directly proportional to how nasty the organism is? All its mechanisms, which we call virulence. But on the other hand, it's inversely proportional to that patient's own immunity or resistance, isn't it? It's always easy, easy to think in terms of three. And probably with all of the immune diseases we have now, I think that this R thing is the big thing. And it's not really fair to say that if you have great immunity or resistance, you know, you can throw anybody at a thing and they're not going to get it. But probably the emphasis is more on the patient's immune system now, rather than whatever the intrinsic nastiness is of the organ. But the nastiness is directly proportional to the intensity or the infectivity, and the resistance is inversely proportional. And of course, I mean, there's another little comment there. Something, Whenever I ask a question and I put it in there, the answer is almost always yes. And if I don't answer it myself, the answer is obvious. It's a rhetorical question. Which of these three letters, I, V, or R, is the primary consideration in diseases of immunocompromised or immunosuppressed patients? And of course, that's R. That's their immunity. That's their resistance. Next one. Infectivity is general. It doesn't matter what part of the taxonomy we're talking about. We go all the way from viruses to arthropods. I can't think of a fourth mechanism of infectivity besides these three. Let's keep it simple. An agent could cause a direct damaging toxic effect 
and the cells of the host. That's very easy and obvious. But it can also produce or create substances other than it. In the case, the most notorious example is is toxins from bacteria, but there can be toxins from other organisms as well. And then the primary uh, infectivity, damage, necrosis will be not necessarily directly from the uh, organism or the infectious pathogen, but from the toxins that it's produced. Now, another interesting thing, and it, it almost seems like this is a suicidal mission in evolution, but sometimes the, uh, the real damage to the patient is not directly due to that tiny little bug, which may or may, or not, may not still be there, or any type of toxin, but it's the inflammatory response around it. Some of the inflammatory responses, the cellular response, can be so massive, it could actually do damage. You know, abscesses, for example. Abscesses in the brain that might not have any organisms in it, that might not have any toxins in it, but if it's pressing on certain areas, that's like incredible damage. So these are really the three basic ways. And if, if anybody there can think of a fourth way, I'll be glad to pay your fare to uh, Sweden when you pick up the Nobel Prize. Mm -hmm. Next one. Now, let's talk about a little more specific infectivity. Let's talk about viruses. And we're going to spend a little time about all the little taxonomic classifications we're going to have to move into the big four, which are viruses, bacteria, <coughs> fungi, and parasites. We're not going to worry about prions or uh, obligate intracellular things. Let's talk about viruses. A virus has to attach, no matter what. A wide variety of mechanisms for attaching. It has to gain entry into the cell. It not only has to attach, but it has to somehow get in there. It then has to undergo transcription, okay? So the virus's DNA has to communicate with the host DNA. And of course, if it's DNA to DNA, that's regular transcription, okay? But if it's RNA, it has to go from RNA to DNA, which is reverse transcription, isn't it? And then it has to do its translation. It has to make what it has to make in order to replicate. It has to build proteins. It has to enable the viruses, you know, 10 or 20 genes. It has to give them the material to do what they're supposed to do. That's mostly make other viruses. That might be seen, for example, as inclusions within the cell. They could be actual specific viral inclusions, or if you're looking at them under a regular old uh, HMV microscope, they could be inclusions that might include the viruses, but are much bigger. Because remember, there's no buddy in the world that I can, you know, no matter how great their microscope was, that actually saw a viral particle on HMV microscopy. In the process of doing that, there could be reduced host cell function, which includes death. If you want to call it uh, pathologic death or necrosis, you can. If you want to say it's triggering off the apoptosis mechanism, you can say that too, because it really does both things. You can have cell injury to be reversible or irreversible. There could be lysis of that cell, break up of the nucleus, carrier reps, it can do that. The virus can then stay in the cell for an indefinite period of time. You know, the, the family of uh, her, uh, herpes viruses are famous for this. And that period of time could be years. It could be many years. And then something could happen, usually related to the patient's immunity, that could trigger it off to go wild again. Last but not least, you've already known, because I was here, I was sitting right there, and you've known what certain viruses can do, okay? You know about the Epstein-Barr virus. You know about the hepatitis virus. Would it be fair to say that these viruses are the actual causes of cancer? Well, it wouldn't be unfair, but you know that it's, uh, you still have to take in the concept of initiation, promotion, and the genes that affect growth. And it's not very likely a specific virus with any of these other factors 
being around is going to be causing an it threat. So a transforming virus is a virus which has the ability to greatly uh, enable or hasten or be a key factor in oncogenesis. Next one. Okay, we'll go over the bacterial infectivity uh, general principles, then we'll take a break. Like a virus, a bacteria has to adhere also, it? it has to get into contact with the cell, either directly through a variety of methods. It has to gain entry into the body, okay? It has to break down one of those anatomic barriers. It may or may not produce toxins. You notice we didn't have this here for the virus, did we? Probably correctly speaking, I don't think you can really talk about viruses as producing toxins. Okay, they can produce substances uh, related to their anatomy, which act like toxins, but they don't secrete endotoxins, exotoxins. The general principle with bacteria, once again with a few exceptions, is that the gram-positive organisms uh, will be exotoxin, the gram negatives are endotoxin, and of course endo means actual bacterial components, exo means secreted proteins. That's a general rule, and there's a few exceptions to it, and you might be able to think of a few exceptions, but just like the gram staining process in general, I'll let the thing think in terms of. So when you hear of an exo, when you hear of an endotoxin, you're almost always talking about a gram negative. When you hear of an exotoxin, it's, it's probably just as equally likely to be gram positive. Next one. Okay, this is what this is my favorite slide. And I guarantee you, I am gonna make sure that that is absolutely on the test. We'll talk about it, and then we'll take our 10 minute break and play a couple of songs during the break. Uh, immune evasion. I, I don't know, you've probably seen the movie Karate Kid, and I, I can remember one line that really sticks out in my mind. And it's Mr. Miyagi talking to Danielson, who's teaching him how to fight. And Mr. Miyagi says to Danielson, best way to avoid punch, no either. And like, that's a really, very, very wise thing to say. So, the best way for a pathogen and all of its mechanisms to avoid being attacked is to not be there, is not to be accessible to the forces that are capable of destroying it. Related to that is the same things that tumor cells do. You know, these pathogens, no matter which ones we're talking about, they can mutate, they can mutate to the degree that they make themselves inacceptable to normal immune defense mechanisms. That's number two. Another thing reminds me a lot of these submarine or you know jet fighter movies I've seen where you know somebody's trying to uh, destroy a submarine or bomb or, uh, or shoot another plane out, and they jettison some heat particles that fools the enemy into thinking that it's it, and they actually shoot it at the things that are shed rather than at the organism themselves. So uh, antigens and other particles will be shed in many cases and they will be destroyed, but the main bug gets the wrong. So that's another really, really common mechanism. And of course, we, we can't ignore uh, innate immunity either. Not just barriers, but things like toll-like receptors and things which are completely independent of antigen-antibody considerations. So a lot of times those bugs know how to resist them as well. And I'm going to use the example again of tumor cells because when you're talking about all the nasty things that tumor cells do <coughs> after they have been initiated, step one, Dr. Jalan mentioned, after they have been promoted, multiplied, and after they have been propagated or spread, okay, one of the very nasty things they can do is to actually destroy the cells that kind of destroy them. They become smarter than the immune system. 
So some of these things are smart enough to actually prepare the same T cells that would like to destroy them. Just kind of remember those, write them down, and we'll take a break. Yes? Okay, well, here, this is a real good example. Let's say that uh, you have antibodies against a certain bug, a couple of bacteria, okay? Well, if the antigens that you have antibodies against are shed by the bug, then you're destroying the jets and things that are shed by the bug. It okay. happens a lot. Thanks. Okay, it's, uh, we, uh, we did an hour. Um, <clears throat> We'll take a 10 minute break. I'll play three uh, pieces of music. I'll see if our online people <coughs> heard me well, answer some of their questions. See you back in 10 minutes. Thanks again. Yeah. Thank you. Could the online people hear me well. I'm going to open up the question box and ask that question right now. Somebody said no sound. Whoa. Well, I'm showing that it's giving sound. So if you are not responding, it means you didn't hear my sound. Whoa. I'm going to ask the question again. Can you hear the sound? Can you hear the sound? For those of you that are still there. Uh, please move closer to the mic. Okay, I'm right by the mic now. Can you hear me? Oh, somebody's using the telephone. Well, that's important to know. That means I screwed up somewhere. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to play a couple of songs, and during that, I'm going to try to see if I could fix my microphone. You know what? Sometimes, even though that's plugged in, mm -hmm. that's, that's not really a microphone. That's what it's called a line edge. Okay. So I'm going to see if I could. Uh, let's see. Audio. Well, it's not called the mic. Uh, it might be called a recording playback internal mic. No, it's not the internal mic. Let's try line in. Okay, can you hear me now? And can you hear the music? Oh. See, I don't think I can hear you clearly now. Okay, well. I understand you can all hear me now, but you were cheated during the lecture because I had the wrong button. And that's why nobody's there. There's only seven people that are still hanging around here. Okay, for those of you that are still there, let me ask you two questions. Can you hear the music? And can you hear me? Hello? Windows, the balls, internal mic. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Whoops, I screwed up again. It's not the default of those. It's not the one in. Maybe it's that. Well, I don't know. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Oh. See, there's not there's nothing going on over there. They can't hear me. And really, I really feel bad about that. Oh, that's, that's fine. Did, did, can you read what it says there? Uh, no, that's fine, that's fine. Does it say mic or line in? Or? Yeah, it's fine, it's fine. Okay. Uh, I'm 
try microphone again. It's not lying in high. Hello? Can you hear me now? Nope. But there was something going on before. You did something before, right? Yeah, I think I heard this. I think this one is what I had. No, I didn't hear it. Hello? Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? No. No. Whoops. We have two more songs to fix this. Um, let's try this. Can you hear me now? It looks like you can hear me now. Is that correct? Can you hear me now? According to this, you can. No, they can only hear the music. They can't hear the microphone. See? They're hearing the music, but they're not hearing me. And I had it working the other day. See, I'm supposed to be the expert on this, and I'm completely... Are you pretty good at this? Can you read what it says right now? Yeah. 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 Well, look at it. I got a few options here. I got record playback. I got default device. Well, that's what I thought. Can you hear me? It's not working. You just have a power button or anything? Hold on. I got something here, though. See, wait, but we got more options here, though. Hold on. I think I can make this bigger. What says line in? Try to try putting it on microphone instead. And then just say okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but that can you hear me now? If they can, somebody will say something. Can you hear my voice? Okay. Okay. You fixed it. So you, when you plug it in, you have to say mic. Okay. Okay. Thank you, we fixed the problem, and I'm sorry it didn't work before. But if you could hear me clearly now, and the music, just say yes. Okay, thank you.
still hearing me? And are you still hearing the music as well? Thank you. Sorry for the mix-up at the beginning. I had the wrong button pressed. Okay, that was uh, three songs. Usually I play like about three songs and they're about three or four minutes each. Plus we fixed a major uh, technical problem during the break as well. I didn't realize that was you know, cheating the online people out of significant audio. I don't know if it was complete lack of it or whether it was just bad, but we fixed it and we did some tests. Uh, one of the questions that was asked during the break, and I'm not surprised, is a question that's always been asked. What, how many questions, what kind of questions, like, okay, like, I know there's always, like, a lot of, even at your stage, you know, tests and board anxiety. I know how important that is to you. <coughs> I told you the, the first class that you really don't have to worry about. You know, we're going to go over all the major parts, you know, if you want to call them yellow points. Like, for example, I consider that to be probably one of the key points. So when we do our a review, maybe there'll be a ten of them, and I'll probably say, without a doubt, something is going to come out of my exam page that's going to have to make you understand what I consider one of the most important aspects of pathology with respect to infectious diseases. So I said it before, and I'll say it again, and I'll probably wind up saying it like many, many other times because you know I don't blame you, but 
You don't have to worry about that. You have to worry about the big picture. I can also tell you, historically, I've never flunked anybody in my life. Once the dean had a gun to my head, they told me that I had to flunk somebody because the kid was caught cheating. And if I didn't flunk him, I'm in deep trouble. Well, I took that as a challenge, and I made sure the kid didn't flunk. I made sure he passed by one point, because I don't like people telling me I have to fail people. It's my judgment whether I should or not. Plus, these tests that schools give, they give them because they have to give them. They give them good tests. They wouldn't allow us to be schools, because the people that are the pencil pushers, the bureaucrats, the paper clips, you know, they want to see that we uh, prove to you force you to learn, force you to go to class. I, I don't believe in all of that. You come here if you want to learn, you can use the resources, you can take them or leave them. And you know, all of the schools are saying, well, you know, we have to teach our students to be self-learners. And you know, yeah, they say, well, so you have to force them to go to class, you have to force them to take the exam. To me, that's not self-learning. You're gonna be self-learners the rest of your life. The best way to start is freedom right now. So that was a big one, and let's start to move on a little bit now. Uh, next one, please. When we looked at our three big letters before, the I, the V, and the R, I told you that, in general, more and more and more attention has been given to the R, the resistance, the immunity, the innate immunity, the acquired immunity, the uh, diseases that attack and weaken our immunity, which you probably spent a couple of days on when you were in the chapter on immunity. When you're taking that, right? No? That usually comes before chapter eight, and we're on chapter eight, so I assume you, you, you did the thing on immune diseases. If not, we can do it again. He also asked if I could do the chapter on immunity. And I said, sure, I'll be happy to, somewhere along the line. But don't you have a course called Immunology mm -hmm. as well? Well, that's how I feel. I feel the same way with this as I do about microbiology. There's no way I could teach you in a few days, you know, with an entire course might take several months to teach you. But if you're having like a whole big immune course, you know, I feel like I'm only going to be touching the surface. But nevertheless, there's a lot of material there on diseases of immunity, which I'll be glad to do. But I think we'll be doing uh, pediatrics next. Is that chapter 10? Mm -hmm. Robins? We do rubens or robins? Okay, well, that's what I thought. Okay, it doesn't matter. Even though, theoretically, any organism can be pathogenic. Even the organisms that we normally think is non-pathogenic. Historically speaking, depending on the person's immune status, those organisms may be very, very pathogenic. And you know, the general name for that is opportunistic infections. It's an infection that would not occur in a so-called healthy person that has a normal immune system. If you have an immune disease in which your T cells or any other aspect of immunity is being weakened, these organisms can then infect. And that really is true with anything. And if you took the list of diseases that AIDS patients get, the opportunistic infections, it would be a list that would fill you know, all of these walls ten times over. Theoretically. Just like if you look at the different types of cells that the AIDS virus can do that, besides T lymphocytes, you have all of the complete histology. That's almost been reported everywhere. But nevertheless, there are still certain common patterns of recurrent, very, very, very common infections that occur in patients with you know, compromised status. 
Now, if I showed you these, this list here, which is the top 10 or eight or whatever it is, you're gonna say, oh, well, this, these are, we all know that AIDS patients get this. Well, keep that in, in mind because the diseases, the infections, the opportunistic infections that AIDS patients get are exactly the same as a theoretical disease that any severely immunocompromised uh, patient would get. So, isn't it kind of interesting that the thing that seems to be at the top of the list happen to be mostly protozoal diseases? Cryptosporidium. We mentioned it a few minutes ago. Something that we're probably all exposed to would never, ever, ever think of causing damage to our intestinal epithelial cells. We could be wiping out the, those same cells in an AIDS patient or any immunocompromised patient. Pneumocystis carinii. Now, I know I always say PCP, pneumocystis carinii, and you know it's not really called carinii anymore. They changed to the C to a J, now it's called Gerovaci. But you know, everybody called the pneumonia, the most common type of pneumonia that AIDS patients get, PCP. I guess, does that mean we have to call it BPJP now? I don't know, everybody still calls it PCP, so I still call it pneumocystis carinii. You know, that's also generally in the category of a protozoan. Toxoplasmosis. We know there can be a congenital variant. We know that in adults, you know, nobody here is going to get toxoplasmosis. You know, if you do, the first thing they're going to ask you is, you know, where's your cat? But toxo, something that normally would not infect humans, we have enough immunity to it. You know, very, very common. In fact, I probably said this before, but I'll say it again. The AIDS patient comes in, you know, not just an HIV positive patient, but a patient that has, by all normal current uh, diagnostic criteria, all evidence for what's called full blown AIDS, you know, rather than just HIV positive, is probably going to have these infections. You know, uh, AIDS patients very frequently uh, carry antibiotic inhalers that are pretty, pretty good for PCP, even if they don't have radiologic evidence of the disease. I mean, it's, it, it's going to be enough. These are very, very, very common. Fungus, candida, most common fungus in the world. You know, candidiasis, it's all over the place. It occurs in moist, non characterized straight squamous <coughs> epithelium. The mouth, the oral cavity, the esophagus, the vagina, even on the skin, which is, of course, characterized. Okay? Um, when an AIDS patient comes in with an esophagitis, and you're doing easy determination, scraping, culture, whatever, against Canada, that was always one of the major diagnostic criteria. This patient was no longer HIV positive. This HIV positive person with a candid esophagitis is full-blown AIDS. Uh, bacterial infections. These are normally not routine staph and strep. And the usual gram negatives, are they? They are the things that uh, don't even uh, matter in terms of granting it's tuberculosis. And even more so than tuberculosis, the other acid fast organisms, the <coughs> mycobacteria, that are not tuberculosis, the atypical mycobacteria. Nocardia, sort of like a fungus. Salmonella, typical bacteria there. We have negative, right? Okay. And we all know the ubiquitousness or the fact that the viruses that we call herpes family, whether it's herpes simplex, herpes disaster, uh, EB virus, the things that we're all exposed to, you know, normally, if we've been exposed to them, most likely they'll just be from the 90 state forever. But 
the viral, the chief viral infections to occur in immunosuppressed hosts. You probably are thinking again, AIDS, AIDS, AIDS. But this is like anybody that's severely immunosuppressed. They're all in the herpes family, aren't they? CMV, herpes simplex virus, very cell disaster. So why don't you just keep that as your list of the common infections occurring to people with general and specific immune suppressed disorders. Uh, if you want to also remember it as the most likely infection of AIDS patients get, that's even better. Next one. Okay, we're back into generalities again. And all the things we've talked about don't really mean very much unless we're talking about a definitive diagnosis. And there's a variety of ways. And if you've ever worked in a lab, this is probably going to be you know, old hat to you. But you know, the one thing is to do the direct positive pathogen uh, visualization. It could be a gross visualization. You could have, a, you could have a couple of proglottids in here. You know, you could you could have the spider that they killed, that bit them. You know, uh, most likely, however, it's going to be microscopic. And if it's microscopic. You're probably going to be doing per, most likely uh, some kind of special stain. Most likely stain, especially if it's bacteria, would be a gram stain. If it's a fungus, that's the pathogen. I could probably rattle off a few nice fungal stains. But once again, the PAS stain is very, very good, very, very cheap. Very, very easy. There's a variety of modifications to other stains, and there's fancy silver stains, and they're hard to do. But if you want to think PAS is basically the same thing that'll visualize fungi, you know, <coughs> are they balls, are they hyphae, are they septate, are they branch? And of course, cultures. That's mostly for bacteria. If you want to identify a specific virus, one thing to do, you're not going to get a culture of it, obviously, because it's an obligate intracellular organism, isn't it? What you're going to do is, especially in the older days, you're going to put that virus in a standardized situation, which there are human cells or other cells, and you're going to look for the pattern of cytopathologic effect that it causes. On the other hand, now that we have PCR, and it's done for just about every type of uh, infectious pathogen known to man is amazingly accurate, amazingly sensitive, amazingly specific, and generally amazingly uh, expensive too. That's why it's not done routinely. I still think for bacteria, cultures are the main thing. Uh, and if you are not going, you're interested in the uh, actual organism itself, but the pattern of antibodies, they produce in the host, and that's the whole family of serology. Quantitate the antibodies, identify them by you know, labeling them with fluorescent antibodies against those antibodies. So these are generally the wide variety of techniques that are used in the lab. If you work in a lab, you may be doing them, and if you're just ordering the test, you can expect if they know you want these very, very specific. Uh, answer is the one that you need. They're going to be doing one of these things. Another thing to remember is that, uh, like we mentioned with the parasites, uh, very often some of these techniques may be kind of bypassed that they know that they're in, a, uh, in an epidemic situation, for example. They're not going to be doing a lot of fancy tests to find out that the diarrheal disease is. Uh, uh, caused by you know, typhoid fever, uh, there's a typhoid uh, fever epidemic going on. Next one. Okay, now we're going to go back to, once again, really solid pathology. And the thing I want you to keep in mind when we talk about the various types of uh, host or cellular reactions to a wide variety of pathogens is that this is absolutely nothing different than what you learned in your 
chapters about the chief and trying to organize the information and dealing with exactly the same. In fact, when we were going over that material, chapter two, is that right? Acute information? Uh, you were probably, they were probably showing a lot of these things with respect to a pathogen as being the stimulus, you know, rather than something like, you know, radiation or trauma or tissue necrosis or infarction. So when we talk about the different types of tissue reactions to pathogens, remember, they're generally nonspecific. So almost any type of the organism, any type of organism that we've mentioned so far can cause an acute suppurative reaction, suppuration meaning pus, suppuration meaning neutrophils, suppuration meaning something I call polys, or PMNs, polymorphonuclear lymphocytes. Cultures may or may not be positive. If they're positive, you know it's bacterial. And then what I call the mononuclear reaction, or what I call monos, because that doesn't mean monocytes, it means lymphocytes and macrophages. So that's like a little point of confusion. So pathologists will say a, a polymorphonuclear the cell infiltrate is acute, and a mono cell is chronic, with monos meaning lymphocytes and macrophages. And of course, macrophages are also monocytes, aren't they? Macrophages are monocytes that have gone into tissue. Okay, also remember one of the uh, features of mononuclear inflammation would be a histia, basically a histiocytic type of reaction, which we call granulomas. And sometimes that's fairly specific. Now I'm gonna tell you something now, and you probably, I hope you know it, and I'll probably say it again, is that the really neat thing is about granulomas. We love to spend a lot of time talking about granulomas. One of the really neat things about them is that when you see a granulomatous pattern of inflammation, you can almost zero in on certain types of pathogens. You know, probably a lot of bacteria can cause it, but they generally don't. Probably a lot of viruses can cause it, but they generally don't. So when you see a granulomatous reaction in tissues, you're probably gonna be narrowing it down 90% of the time to one of the four categories. It's gonna be either tuberculosis, you know, probably the number one cause of granulomas in the world, or it's gonna be fungi. For some reason, the funguses, whether they're the superficial fungus or whether they're the deep pulmonary fungi, they're probably going to be a granulomatous pattern of reaction. Third thing is something that's not really an infectious disease per se because we haven't identified a specific pathogen, and that's sarcoid. And the general rule is that if you see microscopically granulomas, that are caseated or necrotic in the middle. But the pathologists and the clinicians that think, well, this is probably tuberculosis. The granulomas of sarcoid may look identical, except there's usually no caseation and there's usually no necrosis in the middle. So the general rule is uh, you get a granuloma, of course, you culture, you culture for everything bacteria, you know, TB, fungi. You can't culture for viruses, though, can you? And if uh, it's not culture, if it's not, if it doesn't culture anything, and it's not caseated, it's most likely sarcoid, because sarcoid uh, is both a pulmonary and a systemic infection, just like tuberculosis is. The last thing, the fourth thing, as I promised before, when we said TB, fungi, and sarcoid, the fourth thing is obvious, it's foreign bodies. One of the most common reasons for a random mountain reaction is for suture material or particles that somehow made the trauma, you know, have gotten into the soft tissues. Another thing to remember is when I also talk about fibrosis as a general host reaction or hemosiderin, you know, blood pigment, or calcification, it's also totally, not only is it totally nonspecific, but they generally follow 
these acute and chronic reactions, whether it's infectious or not. Next one. So, what's this? Well, let's go to our histology. Hey, these look like smooth muscle cells. Hey, let's look closely at these cells. Well, they don't look like they have a mono or round type of nucleus. They look generally kind of bent. So maybe those are neutrophils, that's polys. So, polys infiltrating smooth muscle. What's the diagnosis? Acute inflammation of the smooth muscle. But what, what if that smooth muscle just happens to be part of an appendix? You got your diagnosis. And actually, this was a boring question. I, I, I tried to, I, I tried not to do this, but I can remember a board question saying, what does it take to diagnose acute appendicitis? Neutrophils within the muscularis, not the serosa, not the mucosa, not the submucosa, but in the wall itself. So, okay, we have acute inflammation in the wall of an appendix. What does that mean? Does that mean that there probably was a specific organism, maybe a bacteria or a virus or a fungus or who knows what causing that? Well, almost all of the appendicitis that you'll ever encounter in your young or old patients or maybe if you've had it yourself, they weren't really caused by a specific organism. Specific organisms may have secondarily affected, but when you go over uh, the GI chapter, we talked about acute appendicitis, we're going to be saying most of the textbooks will say that appendicitis is generally preceded by something called a fecal lip or a stone of feces, and generally that fecal lip plugs up the small movement of the appendix, and because of that, maybe the blood flow is uh, compromised, and maybe because of that, you know, some of the wall may become necrotic, and because of that, you know that necrotic tissue is one of the stimuli for acute inflammation. And because of that, some of the secondary bacteria in feces, which are normally supposed to stay in the feces, are now have exposure to the tissue. But they're not the ones that actually cause the appendicitis either. Okay. Uh, Next one, abscesses. I would say, if I, had, if I was to show you the most boring pathology slide I could ever think of, it would be an abscess. All an abscess is, is a pocket of pus. And you generally look at you know, all know what pus is, yellow streak, and then walled off, and you walled off by virtue of a uh, fibrous capsule. But they'd be not walled off, but they're still localized. If, if they're not localized, then they're generally going to be spread and dissected, if it would work for it, into the surrounding tissue. If they are localized by virtue of the capsule, they're more likely to be stable. And they're more likely to eventually heal as well. Right. So one of the um, processes, both you know, pathological and radiology, you know, in the other part of the body, is if you see a sort of dense, fibrous capsule surrounding the abscess, most likely that's going to be pretty contained. So the outside of that abscess, radiologically and pathologically, is going to be tired because there's a lot of fibrous tissue. And then the inside is still going to be liquefied. So it may have water signals or less density signals, radiologically with CT or very bright water signals on MRI. And all it is is an infection due to anything an acute infection, which means neutrophils, that's localized to one area. Are we only wondering if the difference between an abscess and a cyst? Is that a cyst? Okay, good question. A cyst generally is not an infectious process per se, but if an abscess <coughs> becomes totally liquefied and now you just have pure water, which can happen, then you call it a cyst. Uh, a cyst very, very often has an epithelial lining, which would be a true cyst, especially in areas that normally are cystic that we uh, But when you use the word cyst, you are almost never implied in an infectious process. So there's two things to be able to say. Yep. Yep. Now, let's, you, you point it to your neck. Let's say you have a fibroblastal duct cyst. Now, what's a cyst? Maybe lined by epithelium. Maybe lined by even a partially thyroid follicle. What happens if it's 
that an infective? Does it still exist? Yeah. You want to call it an infective cyst? Yeah. If it's loaded with pus, you want to call it an abscess too? Sure. Next one. Okay, this is also an unfair picture. And really, in all honesty, I know you can all see this uh, slide pretty well. Look at the cells and ask yourself, whenever you see an inflammatory infiltrate, that's a reaction to an infectious or any other thing, you look at the cells. And you ask yourself one question, in all honesty. You say, well, are most of these cells have round nuclei? You know, like lymphocytes? Or maybe macrophages? Or do most of the cells have kind of a lobulated appearance, like a neutrophil? And remember, you could have both. So here's my question to you. And I don't care whether the answer is wrong or right. I just want to know your opinion. Do you think most of the cells within that inflammatory infiltrate have round nuclei or lobulated nuclei? How many vote for round? I vote for round. If you thought that most of them were lobulated or polys, then there would probably be neutrophils. So this is what we call a mono cytic infiltration, not meaning monocytes, but lymphocytes and macrophages. And mono means chronic, and poly means acute. And when poly is localized to one area, it's acute, but it's also properly called an abscess. Next one. Oh, no, I go back for a second, please. And I think I asked a question down there, and somebody could have really nailed me on this if they wanted to. But they say, well, Dr. Menarsek, I see that you know, there's a lot of blood vessels in there, too. Isn't there a stage of inflammation in which there's a lot of blood vessels that grow in? Remember, it's called organizing inflammation or neovascularity due to all of those little factors in the uh, inflammation drama that are, uh, support the growth of new blood vessels, like EPG effort. Yeah, so he said, well, Dr. Menarsk, I think we should call this organizing inflammation because of the blood vessels rather than chronic, even though most of the cells in there are round rather than lobular. I'd say, okay, you're right, but I think I'm right too. Next one. Ah, granulomas again. I, I know Dr. Jelani is very repetitive. It's probably the thing that I repeat 10 times in every course about granulomas. The reason why I do is because when I had my oral exams in pathology, that was the number one question that was asked me. I was just a, a student your age, and I go into this big room, and the guy was gonna do my oral pathology exam, and just when he turned in my grade, and I'm really nervous. And that's what they did uh, for lab at the University of Illinois. And we all kind of feared it. And he says, he showed me a picture of a granuloma, and the girl called his name. <coughs> and uh, I basically, you know, remember it sort of, because we had a couple of slides of granulomas, I go, well, I remember we had a case of TB that was a granuloma. I know that SARS caused that granuloma. I know most of the fungi uh, caused granulomas. And they talk about stitch granulomas. You ever hear that word? Foreign body granulomas? That's when you put in a stitch or a suture, and then after a while, that suture is being absorbed, absorbable suture. Well, it's absorbed because the cells that are absorbing it are histiocytes and multinucleated fused cytoplasmic masses of histiocytes called giant cells, which eventually chew that cell up because the macrophages have phagocytic properties, don't they? That's a granuloma. And there's a multinucleated giant cell, and there's another one. If somebody asked you to actually count, you had a good microscope, you could probably say, well, let's say there's probably about 30 of them over here, and maybe 10 here, and seven or eight there, who knows? But it doesn't matter. You don't need multinucleated giant cells to cause granulomas. But they're usually there anyway. What you do need are localized clusters of macrophages. And macrophages are identical to histiocytes. And the pathologists love to use the word histiocyte. And it's probably more appropriate to say macrophages. 
and they found themselves saying, this is the all the time. So, what does it take to cause a granuloma? We all know the four categories, TG, fungi, sarcoid, and foreign bodies. The chief cell are histiocytes. Some of them are fused to be giant cells. And look, what do you see kind of at the edge of the histiocyte? They look like lymphocytes. Very small, round, hardly any cytoplasm. Single, round, because those are all lymphocytes. The fourth type of cell, which you don't see much of over here, uh, maybe there's a couple. The fourth type of cell are sort of spindly cells. Those are fibroblasts. So you already know the four components of granulomas. And there are certain specific triggers biochemically, certain growth factors that cause these. And uh, I don't think they're worth mentioning now. They may have mentioned them during your uh, discussions on inflammation. But with granulomas, the longer a granuloma has been present, the more likely it is to have fibroblasts. Because isn't it true that any inflammatory process that goes on for a long time will actually cause more action of fibroblasts, more fibrosis, more collagen, more hybridization? It's part of the remote old crop. So, wouldn't it also be logical then that if you had a granuloma in your body, your patient's body, maybe the radiologist will pick it up because it's very round and calcified and they'll get their diagnosis of, you know, pulmonary granulomas, which is mostly TB and fungi. But let's say that a granuloma is almost all fibroblasts. Do you think that's an acute granuloma? something that might be years old, or months or years old. Well, the more, the more calcification, the more fibrosis, the more likely it is to be old, right? So here's a, another question that would follow that. Let's say that you're a chest surgeon and you're a little part of lung. And you can tell that's lung because you can see all the eli around it. You see these great head And then you say, well, maybe the dead TV will have some kind of fungus. What is that? Well, let's culture it. So you culture the granuloma, and here's two conditions. One granuloma has nice, fresh-looking cells, maybe even a little necrosis on the center, and the other granuloma is solid, fibrous tissue and calcium. Which one is more likely to show positive culture? Not the calcified one, not the fibrotic one, but the fresh one. And, uh, very often they'll use the word healed granuloma rather than old granuloma to imply that it's almost all fibrotic or calcified. So is it possible, let's say, in the lungs for a granuloma that's been there for a long time to appear to grow also the tumor? Yeah. Because even though a granuloma, or say old granuloma, or something that's been there for a long time, meaning years, meaning it probably has a lot of fibrous tissue in it. Even though I told you that's not likely to reveal active culture, they can still do that. And what would you think would be a condition by which an old granuloma is that growing? Yeah, in, uh, in no time So we had a neighbor in Maryland, and uh, she had uh, rheumatoid arthritis. She'd been on uh, steroids for a long time. And she also had old TB, and you know, she came from Ecuador. And it just so happened that the chronic administration of steroids or severe rheumatoid activated her TB again. And she died. It happens all the time. That's a very, very common scenario. Um, next one. Okay, this one I should almost, I almost feel guilty for putting this one in because we already talked about fibrosis. And does it matter what organ this is? Does it look like it might be a pancreas or some kind of exocrine gland? Or, I don't think it's a breast. Could it be a salivary gland? I don't know. But you do know that there's a lot of these little spindly cells around in between these lobules. And all that means 
is that whether there was an infectious pathogen there or not, it is now at the stage where there's a lot of fibrosis going on. And if there's a lot of fibrosis, or it's predominantly fibrosis, most likely that infection is no longer active or acute. And remember, we use the term acute and chronic in pathology, meaning either neutral dose or lymphocytes, right? But there's also clinical acute and chronic. And generally they match. A person that comes with a disease, an inflammatory disease, that comes on suddenly, acutely, over a period of hours or days, it's not so likely to have neutral dose, isn't it? If it's something that's been kind of low grade and maybe for months or years, that's more likely to have people like chronic inflammatory cells and fibroblasts. But there are a few good exceptions to that because, for example, a lot of the acute uh, encephalitis, like West Nile, for example, they come on acutely. It can be very sudden, abrupt, intense. If you look at the pattern of inflammation within those blood vessels, they can be chiefly chronic inflammatory cells or mild to mild. Okay, next one. This is also kind of a guilt slide to tell you the truth. Because all you can say here is that there's chronic hemorrhage. You know, hemocytorin. And you know hemocytorin is a pigment. It's an endogenous pigment rather than an exogenous pigment. You know, endogenous pigments, they basically all look the same, and they're almost always inside of macrophages because that's what some macrophages do. They chew up pigment. And in all honesty, uh, all endogenous pigments of which he was in this big one, they have kind of a cold vision, refractile appearance of them on the microscope. But if you say, well, could that be melanin? Or could that be bile? Or could that be lipofusion? Or could that be any other of the common uh, endogenous pigments? I'd say, yeah, but if you see them inside of a, a lung, for example, and you know there's been like hemorrhage going on, well, you don't have to do a special thing to prove that that's hemocytic rather than bile or rather than melanin. But if you wanted to, you could. And if you did a special thing, the Prussian blue, it would be blue. Because you, you have a pigment and it's an endogenous pigment, which means it doesn't look jet black like the exogenous pigments. You know, like tattoo pigment, Pigment. Those are really, really black. You can't see they're golden or yellowish, but they're really, really black. In fact, if you see a pigment that is really black, it's probably an endogenous pigment, like something from a tattoo or more, more likely human citizen, which, I'm sorry, more likely antipodic pigment, which we all have. So, can you have chronic hemorrhage? associated with chronic inflammation and fibrosis following ultimately an acute inflammatory process caused by a pathogenic organism? Absolutely. And that's why it's very late. But remember, this may very likely follow any chronic inflammatory process, whether it's caused by a pathogen or not. Next one. Calcium. This is a great, great, great demonstration of calcium, and it's really dark, and almost all calcium uh, because it's like a crystal, when it comes in contact with the regular microphone, it kind of flakes off, it shatters a little bit. So you like never really see good calcium. It looks like it's always broken up. That's a really good demonstration of calcium, but it's a lousy demonstration of calcification that might be associated with fibrosis and chronic inflammation because that's calcification inside of the renal tube, isn't it? It's not calcification inside of our some big fibrotic process that may have one time been acutely infected by something. Okay, what's the next one, Shelby? Well, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna go over the next four yellow slides, and I might go over them again when I start out uh, tomorrow. But, you know, we've been talking a lot in generality and covering a lot of taxonomy here, and uh, talking about general, general differences, pathologic reactions, you know, 
probably more than enough, probably enough taxonomy that I really, really like to. But in all honesty, human infectious diseases are most likely one of those four. You know, and it's not very likely you're going to be seeing the fourth. And if you do see the third, very, very good chance it's going to be somebody that's immunocompromised. Even if that immunocompromised state is simply due to something common like diabetes. So these are the biggies the virus and the bacteria, the fungi, and the parasites. Let's go over the four yellow slides before we start going into them. You know, we'll cover these in more detail tomorrow. So, let's do the next one, viral. Remember, we said that there was really no consistent good logical ways to classify viruses. Some of them have the word mason, or meaning they're probably associated with some slime we have today. Some of them have the word arbo, which isn't a taxonomy at all, has the word arthropods. So, it's not surprising that, in fact, it's, it's fortunate that the best way to classify viral diseases is not taxonomically, but it's by the pattern of diseases. We talked extensively about acute diseases, chronic diseases, granulomatous diseases. So uh, Robbins has decided <laughs> that the best way to classify viral diseases, we're going to give a few examples of each one, is by clinically, not pathologically, but clinically, whether these diseases come on suddenly, short term, and they can resolve very quickly as well, as well, maybe a few days, maybe a couple weeks, but not much longer than that. Or whether it's a disease that is not only chronic, but it goes into latency for a long period as well. It's a second category. And incidentally, what does that tell you? Almost all of the chronic latent ones are in the herpes family. In fact, they all have herpes virus members, aren't they? And look at almost all of the transacute are diseases that you never see because they're vaccinated for now, with the exception of West Nile and a lot of those other acute occurring viral diseases. And the pure chronic diseases, the ones that wouldn't become latent, perhaps, or they just go on low grade, many for many years. Are almost all in the hepatitis family, aren't they? And even though they call it A, B, C, there's also D and E. They're completely different uh, types of viruses, completely different families and genuses and species. But they all have in common is that any viral hepatitis is probably going to have a chronic nature to it. And then, last but not least, you know, is this big mysterious category of the transforming viruses. You already know that EBV can cause Burkitt's lymphoma. You already know that HPV is the cause for cervical cancer. Oh, huh? So you already know that human papillomaviruses have been indicted as the causative or strongly causative agent in almost every type of squamous epithelial proliferation you can think of. Not just warts, but anything else. So well, those are the categories for viruses. Keep that in mind. We'll probably go over it again tomorrow. Next one, bacteria. We've been through this. We'll say it again. The best way to classify bacteria is by their gram staining and by their shape. The cocci, the rod, the positive, the negative. <coughs> but to remember that there are some that don't stain either positive or negative. They stain instead by a stain called the zeolneals that are acid fast. Those are the category of the TB like. Uh, bacteria, the mycobacteria, which is tuberculosis, and the atypical mycobacteria in leprosy. And then some more uh, bacteria, which don't stain this way and they don't stain that way. Sometimes you can see them under certain microscopic conditions, but the main feature to that is that they have a spiral shape, a spiral. And that's syphilis, a couple of other diseases that are like that. It's the disease that caused me to miss my only class last year which was Lyme disease, the Borrelia bacteria. And overlapping with this are the anaerobes, which be gram positive or gram negative. And then the ones that we said were not really quite fully bacteria. They might not be using uh, oxygen too much, and they have to live inside of the cell. 
sort of can't be cultured out. Mm -hmm. Those are the obligate intracellular. Mycoplasma, chlamydia, top of the list. Just briefly mention it. We're going to it more in detail. Next time, next one, please. The fungals. Keep in mind that even though we probably all have some candida on it somewhere now, it's probably not causing an infection. Almost any virus, especially, uh, sorry, almost any fungus, especially a deep fungus, causes significant systemic infection, it's probably going to be an immunocompromised host. And if they look like balls or yeast, all staining very easy with PAS, the other ones, uh, it's probably going to be one of these two. Uh, classically, and if they are considerably hypo, it could very easily be something else. But no matter which one you're dealing with, it's probably going to be opportunistic. Next one. Last but not least, the parasites. The best way to classify those are the one cell, the protozoan, or the many cells, which are the worms or the metazoan, that can be flatter or round. Okay. I think this is a good time to stop. It's a little bit more than two hours. Um, we could ask some more questions if you want. And we'll uh, finish this up. And uh, when Dr. Jalan was here, whenever we are finished with this, it might take another day or so. Uh, but we're also going to have a layout as well. So bring in the microscope. We'll be looking at slides. And it's a lot more informal than the way I showed you here. And I hope it's a little bit more uh, participants, sorry, because what my online groups usually do is, you know, some of them are like really wise asses, they have a lot of experience or they're recent books. A lot of times they'll give the diagnosis for you before I even show the slide. They can tell you some things on the other ones. So uh, for me, last of all, it's been a lot of fun, and I think you'll have fun too. So that's it for today. Any questions or whatever? Um, go ahead, I'm seeing your slide. Thank you again. I really appreciate this. Are you going to volunteer tomorrow again, or are you going to try to I'm find somebody else? Can anybody okay. here owe you a favor? <laughs> okay. I'll close it down for the online people, too. And uh, ha have you been able to hear me better in the second half over here? Hold on. Let's see what your answer is. Um, oh, I can see I've been kind of far away again when I was straying. I hope that didn't scare you away. But uh, here, was the uh, audio in the second half better than the audio in the first half? That's my question. Well, somebody says yes, somebody says no. Okay, well, whatever the problem was, remember, these will all eventually be online. But if it still has lousy audio, remember, they all are already online on GoPath from last year. And um, so if you feel like you were cheated a little bit with the audio, just go to the movies from last year or download them from Medical School Pathology if you uh, would rather download it to see it rather than to look at it streaming. We'll play our last song and then uh, close it off. This is one of my favorite protest songs of the 60s.
that you can live by and so become yourself because the past is just a goodbye teach your children well their father's hell did slowly go by Slowly go.